Welcome everyone to day two of Earth Science Applications Week. Um, this is the afternoon symposium. Um, and we're going to go over just a little bit of meeting etiquette before we get started. Um, so keep yourself muted and keep your video off, please. Um, this is to save bandwidth. Um, and if you have any questions for the speaker, please write them in the chat or save them for the Q&A sessions. Um, I'm going to be monitoring the, the, the chat the whole time. The whole time. Um, and so there's a little bit of feedback if, if people can just make sure they're muted. Um, and so I'll make sure that everyone's questions get asked during the Q&A sessions. Um, and by way of introduction, I'm Madeline Gregory. I'm an assistant fellow with the NASA DEVELOP program. Um, and during the Q&A sessions, just please raise your hands and the MCs are going to call on you. And at that time, you can unmute and you can turn your video on um, if you want to. Um, and so these sessions will be recorded, so just know that as well. Um, and here's a brief schedule. We're going to kick things off with um, some flash talks. And so these will be a mix of develop and severe presentations. Um, and then we're going to hear from NASA RSET and NASA Power. And then we're going to go back to some flash talks for the afternoon. Um, and some Q&A sessions will be sprinkled throughout these. Um, so without further ado, we're going to uh, start with the flash talks. Um, and so the first up is Southern Bhutan Ecological Forecasting, and we're going to have Tin Lee and Kizang um, come and present. So you guys can go ahead and unmute and get started. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tin Lee Bin Wangden. Hi, I'm Kizang Chukitsuri. And uh, we're here on behalf of our team, the Southern Bhutan Ecological Forecasting 3 team to talk about a project which focus on utilizing NASA Earth observations to assess land cover and land use change in elephant habitat of Southern Bhutan. Next slide. So our team's focus was on the human elephant conflict in Southern Bhutan, with a specific focus in the town of Kelafu. Asian elephants are an endangered species on the IUCN Red List. They are a keystone species integral to the functioning of Bhutan's ecosystems. But recently, expanding human settlements and urban areas in Bhutan have brought migrating elephants in close proximity to humans, leading to human elephant conflicts. Recent rampages of elephants have caused damages to agricultural crops and properties, leading to the loss of lives on both sides. With limited research on land use and elephant habitats in the region, there is room for spatial data analysis of land change dynamics and suitable migratory routes to guide policymakers in urban planning and conservation strategies. Next slide. So we partnered with the Bhutan Tiger Center, the Bhutan Foundation and Bhutan Ecological Society to address this issue using NASA Earth observations from Landsat 5, Landsat 8, SRTM and Terra Modis. Land use land cover maps for the years 2010, 2015, and 2019 were generated in the previous terms of this project. And uh, we used these LULCs to generate land change maps from 2010 and 2019 and uh, forecast an LULC for 2030. We also updated the potential biological corridor map um, created in the previous term of this project by including the projected LULC of 2030 uh, to check future feasibility of the corridors. Uh, we used Tersets land change modeling software and Esri ArcGIS Pro for the analysis. Next slide. So when comparing the 2019 LULC and the forecasted 2030 LULC, we found a uh, noticeable expansion of built up areas throughout the map. Apart from this, uh, there were no major changes in uh, other land cover classes. Uh, the map on the la left shows the potential corridors uh, map created in the previous term in relation to the forecasted 2030 LULC with the most ide ideal corridors shown as least cost paths. The least cost paths are the corridors that have the least resistance in terms of um, elephant habitat. Uh, as our partners had a focus on Kelefu, we looked at a potential corridor that ran through Kelefu uh, near the Bhutan-India border. We can see that the potential corridor shown in pink runs through cultivated and built up areas and um, this would put elephants in close proximity to human settlements, which suggests uh, that this corridor is not ideal. And the figure on uh, the right is a Sankey diagram showing uh, change in land cover in square kilometers across the three years. 
The width of the lines are representative of the relative sizes of area cover in each land cover category. Um, forest was the predominant class across all three years uh, with the minimal decrease of 2.6% from 2010 to 2019. Uh, prominent, uh, a prominent change was in built-up areas with a 64.7% increase from 2010 to 2015 and a massive increase of 383.6% uh, from 2015 to 2019. This shows uh, rapid urbanization in the area in uh, recent years. Next slide. So to conclude, some of the most important takeaways from our project was that we quantitatively observed that built up and cultivated areas have been increasing over the years, but the increasing built up areas proportionally being the greatest, increasing by a total of 688.9% between 2010 and 2019. When comparing our corridor map with the 2030 LELC, the potential corridors mapped in Gallifu are not feasible as it runs through areas with human activities, which also attests to the high numbers of human elephant conflict in Gallifu area. This highlights the need for the Asian elephant conservationists and urban development planners in Gallifu to collaborate on their efforts to reduce human elephant conflicts, potentially saving lives on both ends. Since all the corridors seem to be running along the southern Bhutan border of Bhutan, there is a need to incorporate areas in northern India in this research to prom promote transboundary cooperation and initiative for better conservation strategies of Asian elephants. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you so much to both of you. Um, and oh, sorry. <laughs> um, and next up, we're going to have mapping tree crop plantations in Ghana. Um, so if Jacob wants to unmute and um, and speak about that, we'll have five minutes to talk about that. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jacob Abramowitz. I'm a master's student at the University of Alabama in Huntsville, and I'm working with the Severe program. Next slide, please. NASA Severe is a partnership between NASA and the U.S. Agency for International Development, and it works around the world uh, with partner organizations around the world to co-develop solutions to environmental challenges related to climate change, land use, food security, and many other areas. Um, for some more information about Severe, I would refer you to Stephanie Spera's great presentation earlier this morning. And there are hubs situated all across the globe. I specifically work with the West Africa Hub, and this work focuses on Ghana, one of the focus countries of the West Africa Hub. Next slide, please. So this research focuses on mapping oil palm, and oil palm is the highest yielding oil crop, which means switching from oil palm to another crop to produce um, oil crops would lead to even more area being deforested, meaning that it will likely continue its global expansion um, and there's really no way around the planting of oil palm. Therefore, it's important to farm it in the most sustainable way possible. And oil palm occupies the same area as high biodiversity tropical rainforest, so it's been a driver of deforestation and biodiversity loss across the tropics. Uh, focused mostly in Southeast Asia, but is now expanding into West Africa, and there's predicted to be a large increase in the near future in the West Africa. And you can see on the bottom left, according to FAO data, um, since 2000, the area of planted oil palm in Ghana has more than doubled. And this is important because natural forests and oil palm, although they're both trees, tree crops are much less effective in protecting tropical biodiversity, sequestering carbon, and providing various ecosystem services, both locally and globally, than natural forests are. Next slide, please. So this means it's very important to know where, where tree cover is natural forest and where tree cover is actually tree crops such as oil palm. And in, in uh, many commonly used land cover products, like some of them listed here, I have a Copernicus land cover product, uh, Modus, and uh, Alos Pulsar forest and non-forest product. They don't properly distinguish between plantations or tree crops and natural forest cover. And you can see in these images, in the, on the left side of the image, there's a large forest reserve with natural forest. And on the right side, that outline is a large industrial plantation. This is in the Eastern region of Ghana, and that's an oil palm plantation. And you can see that the oil palm plantation is being classified 
as several different classes like savanna, woody savanna, forest, closed forest. Um, part of it is picking up as woody perennial plants, but that's also related to the planting schedule. It's only picking those up when they're newly planted, and as they grow taller, it misclassifies them as forest. Uh, next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. Sorry, it switched on mine. Is it not showing methodology? Oh, on yours? Yes, now it's there. Thank <laughs> you. Um, sorry about that. So for this, I will be picking study areas throughout the southern portion of Ghana's forest zone, including uh, various regions listed here, western, eastern, central, Ashanti, and Brangahafo, with uh, focusing especially on areas within a 50 kilometer, kilometer radius of known oil palm mills. And these can be thought of as kind of the sourcing zones. Um, and that numbers from various um, studies that find that's kind of the maximum extent which you can transport fresh oil palm to a mill. So those will be the focus regions. And I'm going to be using an approach that's fused optical and synthetic aperture radar um, from various satellites like Landsat 8, Sentinel 2, Sentinel 1, and ALOS Pulsar. This allows for different information to be um, taken from the scene related to structure and texture from SAR and uh, greenness from optical. And I'm going to be exploring random forests, classification and regression trees, and support vector machines, emphasizing differentiating oil palms and natural forests. Next slide, please. So this shows some of the preliminary results um, of the eastern region in Ghana, and you can see that same focus area where now you can see oil palm and forest reserve are clearly in different classes. And you can see that purple represents oil palm and is surrounding the oil palm plantation as well. But oil palm plantations in Ghana, the large industrial ones are often surrounded by a small holder network. And that's what's shown here. Although this is only using Landsat optical imagery. So I'm going to be, next slide please. So I'm in the future going to be incorporating uh, SAR data as well and refining this method to improve it. Um, next slide, please. And I would like to thank my advisor and uh, all the members of the SEVERE team, and thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. Thank you so much, Jacob. Um, and up next, we have Porter and Jay talking about another ecological forecasting project. Thank you. So hello, everyone. My name is Jay Morosik, and I'm presenting with my teammate, Porter Abbey. Along with the rest of our team, this term we worked on the Aztec Island Ecological Forecasting Project, where we characterized nearshore suspended sediments and land cover change relative to sediment bypassing and catastrophic events. Our study area, Aztec Island, is a barrier island off the coasts of Virginia and Maryland. And in the mid 1930s, a jetty system was built just north of the island. This disrupted the natural sediment transport processes and caused accelerated beach erosion of Assateague's coastline. To mitigate this, starting in 2004, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers implemented sediment bypassing operations to restore the natural sediment supply. This involves the transfer of sediment from the jetty system area to Assateague's nearshore zone. However, with recent decreases in the scale of these operations, the effects on the geologic integrity and sensitive ecology of the island were unclear. To address this issue, our NASA developed team had two main goals, characterization and forecasting. We wanted to better understand the interplay of sediment supply, geomorphology, and ecology on ASTIG, so we had to characterize these factors first. Then we could use them to make inferences about the island's future conditions. To accomplish this, we used data from NASA Earth observations like the satellites Landsat 5 and 8, which are shown in the upper left, or I think the formatting moved them around, so now they're in the right. And from here, we split our work for historical analysis into two avenues, sediment transport characterization, which involved remote sensing of turbidity and ocean color, and then land cover classification, which took Landsat imagery and Landsat derived indices of things like moisture and vegetation into account. Finally, we used our historical land cover maps to model future land cover scenarios on the island. Now, as an example of our results, here is a time series map of 
four different sets of land cover data for Assateague Island over time. These show the distribution of the 10 land cover classes we used in our analysis. We derived the two maps on the left from the NOAA Coastal Change Analysis Program land cover products and generated the two on the right ourselves using a machine learning algorithm. One of the trends noticeable here is that the unconsolidated shore land cover type, which includes beaches and is de uh, depicted in light blue here, increased in area over the time span of 2010 to 2018. Using these maps and the conclusions we drew from our results, we were able to better inform our partners at the National Park Service and the US Army Corps of Engineers about the effects of the sediment bypassing on Aztec sensitive ecology and geology. This will help them adjust the sediment bypassing operations off of the island's coast and their management strategies for habitat protection on the island itself. Allowing natural processes to flourish in Aztec is important to protect the habitats of threatened species like the piping plover, which is a shorebird pictured on the left. Maintaining the geologic integrity and natural sediment supply of the island is also important to mitigate erosion since as a barrier island, Aztec protects the mainland from intense storms and waves. We'd like to thank the amazing people involved in our project. It would not have been possible without our science advisor, partners at several National Park Service branches in the Army Corps of Engineers, our NASA developed fellow at our Idaho node, and previous develop teams. So thank you all for listening, and we hope you enjoy the rest of this session. Thank you both for that awesome presentation. Um, up next, we are looking at fire dynamics near Indigenous territories with Katie Walker. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Katie Walker and today I'll be talking about my work titled Analysis of Fire Dynamics Near Indigenous Territories and Protected Areas in an Agricultural Frontier in Brazil. Next slide, please. So just a quick overview of Servir, which you've also heard from Jacob. Um, Servir, the role of Servir is to strengthen the capacity of countries in Asia, Africa, and the Americas um, to use satellite data and geospatial technologies and address critical challenges in climate change, food security, land use, water disasters, and air quality. Servir is a partnership of NASA and USAID, as well as leading technical organizations. So my role in Servir is to support the Servir Amazonia hub. So this work is focused on um, Brazil. Next slide, please. Um, so I'll give a quick introduction first. Uh, next slide. Um, so fire is a very commonly used tool to clear land for agriculture, pasture lands, or roads, and to manage fields in Brazil. Um, fires have also been increasing in recent years. Um, so not only did 2020 have the highest number of MODIS satellite detected fires since 2010, um, but almost all of these fires were illegal. Um, it's very challenging to track and respond to this large number of fires. Um, so a combination of factors also, including drier conditions and expansion, can help these fires escape past their intended boundaries into neighboring forest or grassland. They can also breach boundaries with indigenous and protected areas, which I'll be talking more about later. Um, several major organizations have been tracking fire activity for a number of years, including the Brazilian Space Agency, but there are very few sources of larger scale, validated and timely data on individual fire events. Um, about one third of the land area in Mato Grosso, um, a state in Brazil, is um, covered by agriculture and land use change happens very rapidly here, making it difficult to determine the types of fires occurring. Um, and this information is very helpful because it can help explain um, fire behavior and the likely drivers of fires rather than relying solely on hot pixels. Um, we can also uh, help describe how um, land policy influences fire regimes in Brazil. Next slide, please. Um, so the main research objective here is to um, quantify the role that indigenous territories and protected areas, or ITPAs, as I'll call them in this presentation, um, play in determining fire dynamics and characterizing anthropogenic fire regimes in uh, Mato Grosso, Brazil. So in more um, plain words, we are basically asking the question, what are the characteristics of the largest fires and how are they related to protection status as an indigenous territory or protected area? 
Next slide, please. Um, so here I'll give a very brief overview of the workflow. Um, next slide. So um, for this analysis, I use data from a severe Amazonia consortium partner, that, which is Amazon Conservation, um, and they lead the mapping of the Andean Amazon project or MAP. So data was collected for the 2020 fire season by using MAP's near real time fire monitoring application to record large biomass burning fires. So these are fires with a high aerosol index. Um, after that, I calculated burn severity for each of these fires using a difference normalized burn ratio on Landsat 8 imagery in Google Earth Engine. Um, and finally, um, I used uh, these um, behavioral um, factors as well as the burn severity factors to perform a spatial analysis in ArcGIS. Next slide, please. Um, so just to review um, the four major fire types, we recorded these four fire types, which include crop, crop or pasture land fires, grassland fires, forest fires, and fires on previously deforested land. So this last category is of interest because these fires are often part of a process of deforestation whereby forest fires, um, or forest is first cleared and later burned. Um, next slide, please. So I'll go over my results. Um, so in terms of uh, size and duration of fires, um, tracking fires by type allows us to look at these measures of fire behavior. Um, forest fires are the longest burning fires and have the greatest variation in size and duration. Um, in contrast, deforested area fires were the smallest and grassland the shortest. Next slide, please. Um, we also found that each fire type showed a different seasonality in terms of the frequency of new fires starting on a particular day of the year. So these donut charts represent all 365 days of the year with the most fires occurring on the days that are the darkest color. So crop and pastureland fires track really closely with forest fires, which are the second and the fourth charts. Um, and this supports the idea that these fires can be linked, as I mentioned earlier. Um, next slide. So um, about 22% of major biomass burning fires in Mato Grosso are occurring inside indigenous protected areas. So this is not a problem that's over. Um, forest fires are the most common in terms of the number of fires and the density of fires. Um, and we also see fires occurring very close to these borders as well. Um, next slide. Um, again, there were differences in burn severity by fire type. So this is an important distinction to make. Um, for indigenous territories, fire size and burn severity uh, were larger at distances closest and furthest from the borders, creating the U shape that you see in the top graph. Um, and for protected areas, uh, burn severity increased slightly with distance. So we see these differences um, depending on fire type and protection status. Next slide, please. So there are several main conclusions we can draw from this work. Um, a significant number of major fires are still occurring within these areas. As I mentioned before, about 22% of these major fires in Mato Grosso are occurring within indigenous and protected areas. Um, we do see some mitigation of fires within indigenous territories. Um, and then we also see that protected areas mitigate the number of all fires past 10 kilometers inside these borders, but we do see a higher amount really close to these borders, which suggests that we do see encroachment into these areas or the spread of forest fires from um, crop land management into these areas, um, which is an ongoing problem. Um, we see that burn severity is related to distance um, for only some fire types, which means that this distinction is pretty important to make, um, and that these results overall support that forest fires are not as strongly mitigated despite protections as other fire types, and it also supports that the spread of the spread of these fires into forested areas. Um, so. I would like to thank my advisor, Rob Griffin, as well as Africa Flores, Kelsey Herndon, and Matt Feiner. And um, thank you so much for the opportunity to present. Thank you so much. And moving on to Delaware Ecological Forecasting with McKenna and Jacob. Hello, everyone. I am McKenna Brailer, and I'm here with my teammate, Jacob Frankel, and we're from the Delaware Ecological Forecasting team. And this term at DEVELOP, we assessed land cover and soil to identify suitable sites for tidal marsh migration in Delaware. Next slide. 
Healthy tidal wetlands are vitally important for the state of Delaware. By preserving a sufficient area of tidal wetlands through land reclamation or conservation, some of the valuable services provided by these ecosystems can be protected, such as protection against storm surges, water purification, habitat for native species, and recreation opportunities. Approximately 5,000 acres of Delaware's wetlands have already been lost over the last 30 years due to human activities such as development in agriculture and natural factors like severe weather events, sea level rise, and erosion. Delaware has the lowest mean value ele elevation in the U.S., making it particularly susceptible to sea level rise and erosion. Furthermore, landward tidal marsh migration is likely to occur as a result of shifts in climate and sea level rise, and suitable locations for marsh migration can be limited by impervious land cover, like roads and buildings, as well as natural landscape features. Next slide. We have partnered with the Delaware Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control, specifically the Division of Climate, Coastal and Energy, and the Division of Watershed Stewardship, to achieve this project's four main objectives. The first was to identify current and future wetland habitats, marsh locations, and changing climate variables. Then, using these observations, analyze LULC change, marsh migration, and climate variation over the study period. The analyses were used to generate maps of wetland habitat and marsh locations. And finally, the maps were used to predict areas of likely landward marsh migration in different wetland gain and loss scenarios. To complete this project, the team utilized several satellites, including Landsat 5, Landsat 8, Terra, and GPM. Next slide. The resulting tidal marsh suitability map on the right was created in the suitability modeler in ARC Pro and shows the suitability of land for marsh migration and conservation efforts based on five criteria, including cropland, hydrology flow lines, impervious surfaces, slope, and hydric soils. The low suitability areas show up as red, the moderately suitable areas are shades of yellow, and the high suitability areas are shown in green. On the left and center are the forecasted maps that were created in five-year intervals, using transition potentials that follow current patterns of wetland gain, as indicated by 2010, to 2020 land cover change. The model on the right shows follows current patterns of transition from wetland to water, developed land, and non-wetland vegetation, not accounting for current rates in wetland gain. Next slide, please. The maps on the top are GPM seasonal average precipitation difference maps. They show the difference in the aver average seasonal precipitation between the previous average and the average for the last five years in units of inches per day. We can see that summer has the, the most increase in precipitation, with the largest increase occurring in the northern portion of the state. The maps on the bottom are the Terra Modis seasonal average daytime temperature difference maps. They show the difference in the average seasonal temperature between previous average and the average for the last five years in units of degrees Fahrenheit. We can see that winter and fall have become warmer in the last five years. It is important to note that climate variability is more accurate and definitive when a longer time period is used. <clears throat> Due to constraints of this project timeline, only a 20 year time period was able to be analyzed. Overall, winter has the largest temperature difference and summer has the largest precipitation difference. Between 2010 and 2020, there was a net loss of approximately 1800 hectares of wetland in Delaware's coastal zone. If the current trends of wetland loss are not interrupted, there is the potential for major wetland loss over the next 30 years. Most of the suitable sites for temp tidal marsh migration are located along the coast of Kent County. These results and conclusions will allow our partner to make decisions on mar marsh migration and wetland conservation efforts in the future. Next slide, please. The team would like to thank everyone listed for their contributions to the project. Thank you. Thank you, team. Um, and next up, we're going to do uh, continuous bias corrected stream flow predictions. Hi everyone, thank you for attending. Uh, my name is Bipla Bandari and I'm a grad student with the NASA Servier at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. Today I'll be talking about my ongoing thesis, which is the continuous bias corrective stream flow prediction with deep learning. Next slide, please. As others have mentioned before, Servier strengthens the capacity of countries in Asia, Africa, and the Americas for more informed decision making. I'm the GRE for the Servier Mekong Hub, which includes Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Myanmar, and Laos. This project aligns with the Servier Mekong service of improving the flood forecasting in Cambodia. Having worked in the Servier 
Mekong hub and the reason previously joining as the GRA, the flood improvement service plays a crucial role in improving the flash flooding as well as the impact based early warning for the Mekong River Commission MRC. Similarly, the Department of Hydrology and River Work under the Ministry of Water Resources and Meteorology in Cambodia is directly benefited from this service. Next slide, please. To monitor the flood situations, multiple national, regional and global flood forecasting systems have been implemented across the country in the region using various hydrological models at different hydrological scales. For example, the Stream Flow Prediction Tool SPT and the Global Flood Awareness System GLOFAS are available at the global scale, the Unified River Basin Simulator at the regional level and the national level model depends upon the country. For example, Cambodia, which is the study area for the project, uses the HEC HMS and HECRAS model. Among others, these models differ in spatial resolution as well as the temporal resolution, where the local models are usually confined to the gauge station forecast and have a shorter lead time. In contrast, the global models can output continuously throughout the area and have a longer lead time. The SPT specifically can forecast at every stream in the network, while the GLOFAS is a graded model. The background for this project stems from the study done by previous grad student in 2020, who did a comprehensive study comparing the forecast performance of different modeling system in Cambodia. One of the recommendations and findings of the study was to perform the bias correction to see if that improves the accuracy of the global models, especially the stream flow prediction tool SPT in a way it can be useful in a local context. This study aims to bias correct the SPT prediction to improve its accuracy. Next slide, please. This slide shows a very high level workflow that is developed for the bias correction. The study has a four major objective. The first is to generate a rating curve that maps the stage height to the stream flow using data derived empirical relationships. The next objective is to establish a baseline accuracy for the bias correction of the SPT simulated data sets using the flow duration curve approach. Then the study aims to explore different machine learning uh, algorithms ranging from traditional random forest to more modern deep learning for continuous bias correction. Finally, the study aims to compare and assess the performance of these different approaches among themselves as well as to the base accuracy. Next slide, please. <clears throat> For the rating curve, a clustering based on k-means using the stage and time to derive two groups. These clusters are then run through one class support vector machine to filter the outliers from the established group. The filter data is then fitted through uh, the piecewise polynomial regression to establish the rating curves. Next slide, please. The rating curve is derived for 15 different stations in Cambodia. Here I show you the results obtained for one of the stations, Saktomuk. The model performs reasonably well, except for the high flows where, is, where it is over predicting. The overall mean percentage error ranges from 3 to 25 percentage for various stations and ha have a very high KZ value ranging from 0 0.9 to 0 0.99. Next slide, please. The baseline bias correction is based on the flow duration curve approach as described in the paper Farmer at all 2018 and Jorge at all 2021. So I won't go into details about that. Next slide, please. Uh, this is one of the results of applying the <coughs> baseline bias correction for one of the stations Aktumuk, which we have Look before overall the method performs uh, decently over all these stations. And next slide, please. As the work is still in progress, the next step for me is to apply this uh, traditional time enabled random forest approach as well as the more modern deep neural based model and perform the comparison analysis. Next slide, please. Uh, finally, I want to thank my supervisor, committee members, and everyone at Servier for all the guidance and help. Thank you for listening to my presentation and the opportunity to present today. Thank you so much, everyone. And now we have about uh, six or seven minutes for questions. So does anyone have any questions for the teams? Uh, can you hear me okay? 
Yeah, Jonathan, yeah. we we have a couple minutes of uh, questions before before your presentation. Oh, Do you have okay. A question for I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I have a, a question um, and people can feel free to unmute yourself or drop questions in the chat. But um, for the oil palm presentation, I was wondering um, a little bit more detail on the methodology of how you tell the difference between oil palm plantations and um, forests. I know you went into that a little bit, but I would just love to hear that in more detail. Uh, hello, can you hear me? I don't think my video is working right now. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so for that, uh, in the result that I showed, that was only using Landsat imagery um, from two consecutive dry seasons, and that used a random forest uh, based on training uh, data selected uh, using high resolution imagery. Um, in both oil palm regions and known natural forest regions, um, as well as using publicly available shape files from the roundtable on sustainable palm oil uh, to help in delineating those training areas. But in the future, I plan on, uh, like I was saying, incorporating SAR as well, which is kind of the uh, go-to technique in the literature, because then you can get texture information as well, since both oil palms and Natural forests have green canopies, but they have very differently structured canopies. So the SAR data should help get the accuracy up and really help with that. Cool, thank you for clarifying that. That sounds really interesting. Anyone else have questions? Feel free to raise your hand. I have one, I'll jump in. I was just wondering if either of the two developed teams, the Marshall and Idaho, um, chatted throughout the term about methods, just thinking you were both um, kind of forecasting posts on the East Coast, not too far from each other. So I didn't know if you had any, any kind of crossover discussions sharing, um, you know, ideas about methods or, or what you were seeing. Hi, Amanda. Um, we never really talked to another developed team specifically about methods or anything like that. Um, so I guess I would be really, really interested in understanding how they went about their analysis um, and comparing that with ours. Yeah, unfortunately, we didn't have contact with the Delaware team, um, but now seeing their presentation, it seems really cool. And we did do some similar things with coastal stuff. And so maybe by the end of this term, we can still chat a little bit and just recap what we did. And I think that would be useful. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Awesome. We probably have time for one more question before we um, head over to talking about our set with Jonathan. Does anyone else have have any last minute questions they want to pop in? Adriana, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Madeline. Um, I wanted to ask the Assateague Island team. Um, I previously worked on a developed project last summer with um, sediment, um, and we found a lot of challenges using remote sensing data to specifically measure sediment transport. And I know that you all looked at land cover specifically, but were there any challenges you face um, when looking at sediment with earth observations? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's interesting to hear that you also had challenges because we did run into a lot of that. Our science advisor was really helpful, but um, we ended up using ocean color and turbidity to try to track sediment transport, but it's a little hard with the 30 meter resolution from Landsat. Um, and so it's harder to track like smaller plumes of sediment that would be useful. And then the other thing is there's that ambig ambiguity with turbidity. And so you're not sure if it's just like highly turbid waters or if it's like you're actually specifically looking for sand. There's also the like um, organic matter could be showing up and that's not what we're looking for, but we didn't use methods that could easily distinguish that. Is that also like 
what was happening with you guys? Yeah, a little bit. Um, our methods were a little different. We were looking at um, this method called the unvegetated to vegetated ratio. So we tried to look at how vegetated marshes were. So it's kind of hard to determine what kind of similar, like what's sand, what's um, kind of shrubland, and what is actually unvegetated, just ready to go um, sediment transport. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to your tech paper and reading more about it and uh, the methods you did. Right, thanks for your question. All right, awesome job, everyone. Jonathan, if you want to hop on and share your screen, it's all yours. Sure, yeah, let me uh, make sure this works. Um, my screen okay? Yep, I can see that. Okay, perfect. Um, so, hi everyone. My name is Jonathan O'Brien. Uh, I'm the technical writer, editor, and communications lead with the RSET program. So, uh, to start us off, I'll talk a little bit about what RSET is. Um, so, RSET stands for the Applied Remote Sensing Training Program. Uh, we started in 2009 and we provide accessible and comprehensive remote sensing training to users worldwide. All of our trainings are offered at no cost. Uh, they cover a variety of satellites, sensors, tools, and methods. Um, also offered at no cost through NASA. And all of our trainings demonstrate how to use remote sensing data for a variety of applications. So we have trainings for disasters, health and air quality, uh, land or eco forecasting, and uh, water resources right now. But in the near future, we're also gonna start offering some climate trainings. Um, we use strictly open source software, so anybody in the world, regardless of budget, regardless of budget, can follow along and actually replicate what we're doing in the trainings. Um, all of our trainings can be taken online and asynchronous, asynchronously. So what we do is uh, we'll do a live online session through GoToWebinar, and uh, we can fit up to 3,000 people at a time on GoToWebinar. And uh, sometimes we offer those in English and Spanish, uh, sometimes just in English. And what we'll do is we'll record all of those sessions and we'll put the training materials on the website and YouTube after the fact so people can go and take them on their own, on their own time. Um, so our website is appliedsciences.nasa.gov slash RSET. So I'm going to, if my mouse will unfreeze. Um, when, so what the website looks like. Uh, so here on the main page, the first thing you'll see is our current and upcoming trainings. Um, or if you're looking for a specific type of training, you can go over here to the menu and you'll get a full list of disasters trainings. For example, if you click on disasters, um, or you can click on the find a training button here and you'll get the full list. Um, we also have some other resources down here. Uh, fundamentals of remote sensing for people that are just getting started. Um, the link to our mailing list for training updates and a contact link. So back to the PowerPoint. Uh, so what I wanted to talk to you about is our impact. And one of the ways we measure our impact is through our quantitative impact. Um, so we track all of our participants and since 2009, we've reached over 65,000 participants. These come from 176 countries in all 50 U.S. states. Uh, this is our most recent map from 2020, but uh, this is pretty typical of what we see. Um, since we offer our trainings in English and Spanish mostly, you can see that we have uh, a big following in the Americas but we also have a big following in India and we have a pretty good spread all over the world. Um, so another way we measure our success is through our qualitative impact. So what we do is after each training, we'll send out a survey and then another survey later on to try and see what people are doing as a result of our training. So uh, these are just a few examples of people that uh, actually reached out to us to let us know what they were doing. So first is Lucy Long. So Lucy is an architect and she started with uh, no remote sensing experience at all. 
very little GIS experience and she just stumbled on our trainings um, on Google. And uh, through our trainings, she was able to uh, calculate surface urban heat island and normalize difference vegetation index for Hanoi, Vietnam. So for somebody to start with no remote sensing experience and be able to do all that through online training is pretty impressive. And uh, right now she's actually in the process of publishing a scientific paper on the topic. And here's what Lucy had to say. <clears throat> The detailed instructions in the webinar and guided hands-on exercises substantially helped me learn QGIS and correctly calculate NDVI for my case study site, Hanoi. I reached out to the literature and applied skills I learned from RSET to calculate land surface temperature and surface urban heat island hotspots for Hanoi using the NDVI threshold method. Without RSET training, I definitely could not know how to execute my calculation. My learning process in remote sensing is just beginning. I put full trust in our set and will continue with this program to build my knowledge in remote sensing. And uh, also, uh, next up, we were able to help the Argentine Ministry of Defense learn how to use radar data. So the Argentine Ministry of Defense is responsible for providing meteorological and GIS support to the country as well as uh, physical support in the event of disasters and uh, for Argentina three of the biggest problems are flooding landslides and volcanic activity and radar data can be applied to all of these um, but in their internal training this has always been a huge gap for them so uh, Facundo Casasola we interviewed him from uh, the Argentine Ministry of Defense him and three of his colleagues they took uh, two of our SAR trainings in 2018, and they were able to learn everything they needed to through those SAR trainings. And um, SAR also helps them because they have a lot of cloud cover in Argentina, and uh, SAR can penetrate the clouds. So Facundo said, our set trainings are quite good. It's great that we have the chance to be directly in touch with the instructor, especially when the training is over, and they start answering questions from the students, as I remember. So he's talking about the Q&A session. Um, after every live training session, we also do a, a live Q&A session where the participants online can post questions and uh, they'll be answered by our instructors online. And we also, we transcribe that Q&A session and those also go on the training web pages after the fact and, and those can be a really good resource. So uh, last but not least, uh, Sarah, I think her last name is pronounced Strachan, but I might be butchering that. She's with the Idaho Department of Environmental Quality, and she used knowledge gained from RSET trainings to build an application that feeds in near real-time satellite data, and it provides situational awareness on wildfires and smoke in Idaho and the entire surrounding region in near real-time. So this application, the Idaho Wildfire Smoke Portal, uh, is just the perfect example for us of how people are taking our trainings and what they learned in our trainings and actually using that to uh, integrate NASA resources into their decision making. So Sarah said, in 2012, I started using what I learned in the RSET course to put together a daily PowerPoint of fire locations and imagery to share with air quality forecasters. In the years since, that daily PowerPoint has evolved into an interactive website that helps air quality forecasters understand where the fires are coming from, or uh, where the fires are, where the smoke is coming from, and where it will go to. Um, so that's my last example of our qualitative impact, but if you would like to stay up to date on uh, the trainings we have coming up, we're having a ton of trainings coming up through October. Uh, if you follow us on Twitter, you'll always see the updates on there, or you can go to the website and sign up for our mailing list, and you'll get an update through your email every time we have a new training coming out, along with the registration link. Um, you can check out our YouTube. Uh, you can see all our older videos on there. Um, you can just put those on in the background as you do something else, or uh, feel free to reach out to us via email. Um, our email's right there. And with that, do we have any questions?
If anyone has questions, feel free to unmute and or put them in the chat and we can read them out. Adriana. So I have another question. Great presentation, Jonathan. Um, so you. my question is I've taken several RSA trainings and um, they've all been very helpful. So I'm wondering how often you all revisit these um, trainings to update them with either new data or new processes or algorithms um, that may be out there um, in the world. That's a good question. Um, I don't have I don't have a standard answer for you, but from what I've seen, I would say um, at the at least every couple years but sometimes every year depending on the topic so the way we decide what we're going to uh, do a training on is through that survey data and sometimes we'll also uh, get ref we'll get requests from headquarters to train on a certain topic or just um, from from our colleagues at NASA so there's a variety of ways we come up with what we're going to train on next so it really just depends you know if it's if it's a hot topic like SAR, we'll put out a new SAR training like every year. But if it's something that's more kind of on the fringe, then it might be a while. Uh, are there any certifications or structured courses from basic to advanced? Uh, good question. So we offer certificates for those who attend all of the live sessions and do the homework for um, our upcoming and current trainings. Uh, we don't offer certifications for trainings once they're passed. And as far as structured courses from basic to advanced, uh, the answer is yes. We have a training curriculum on the website, on the homepage. And we have a list with all the links to the training pages, and that's just our recommended path to take, um, starting with fundamentals of remote sensing all the way to our advanced training. So I, I should have mentioned our trainings are also broken up into uh, introductory, intermediate, and advanced. So the introductory trainings will usually cover background theory and, and really not go too in-depth with actually uh, you know, uh, analyzing the data, but the more advanced trainings, those really go in the weeds with, uh, uh, you know, they, they're really hands-on. So hopefully that answers your question. I have another really quick question um, before we, we pass it off to power. Um, I know that you said that there's trainings available and in Spanish and English, and that's why you have such a reach in the Americas. Um, and you also clearly have this this very global reach. Is there any um, demand or plan to expand to other languages as well, or um, other regions, or is that um, are you focusing on, on what you're doing right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, good question. So that is uh, the answer is yes. Um, we offered one training that was trilingual, so we offered it in. Uh, English, and Spanish, and French, but the only reason we were able to do that is because we were collaborating with uh, the UN Development Program, and they had Spanish or they had um, French speakers that were collaborating with us. So they offered their time to translate the materials. So we would like to. Um, that's that's definitely something we want to do in the future, but it's really just a bandwidth issue. We just uh, you know because. We, we can't really just put it through Google Translate because it's the kind of thing where some of the scientific terminology doesn't really translate directly. So you need someone that at least has some understanding of what's going on to uh, to translate it. And you need a human pair of eyes on it just to make sure it doesn't sound weird. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. And if anyone has any other questions about our set, you can feel free to leave them in the chat. Um, but we can pass it off to Power now. Do, do we know who who's speaking there? Do you have the power to share your screen? Yes, I do. I am doing that right now. 
Awesome. Thank you so much. Actually, it says only meeting organizers can share. Sure, I can give you that power right now. Thank you. I just moved it over. So you should be able to well, share now. I can see it. Okay. So I'm Bradley McPherson. I'm presenting on half of the Power Project and Dr. Paul Stackhouse and the rest of our team at the Power Project. So our goal at Power, which Power is the prediction of worldwide energy resources, is to improve the nation's public-private capability for integrating environmental data from NASA Earth observations, analysis, and modeling, particularly focusing on solar radiation to support renewable energy development building energy efficiency and agroclimatology applications. So what are some of the questions that we can be answered with these Earth observations? Particularly, we have users from the University of Florida that do agricultural research to help promote farmers in Sub-Saharan Africa. So they ask specific questions like, how can we help farmers in remote locations more effectively plan to grow crops? So we help with agroclimatology in a specific use case. Also, with ASHRAE, which is the organization of professionals that support heating and cooling across mainly the United States and also, I guess, Canada and so North America. So they ask us how we can understand building environment climate impacts over time. So we know in the United States, there's a lot of very dense and very accurate surface sites to provide meteorology and, meteorology and solar information. But power is able to provide these ground measurements for developing areas far beyond areas that don't have long term surface sites that are been validated and in existence for a long period of time. Another kind of question with Earth's observation is how can we incorporate renewable energy technologies into like an economic perspective? So power provides data to a tool called Red Screen Expert that's maintained by the government of Canada. So as I just like said before with ASHRAE, they can access this solar and meteorology data globally with their application. So it, it opens the ability for the average user that doesn't have access to these precise data measurements to be able to use the data from NASA very effectively and efficiently in these applications. So another one is Ohio State University. So we have like students do classes to do like solar assessments of different locations. And later we'll be talking about how developed teams have done that as well to figure out how we can improve the implementation of solar panels in different locations. So here's just some of the examples for questions. There are a lot more. So, but power provides the data for different specific communities. So as the agroclimatology, here's a good example here. This publication, we there was an increase in corn productivity over the over the corn belt states and using the power tool we were able to or the publishers were able to determine which dr paul stack was one of them was able to determine that that increase in maize production that 25 percent increase was not associated with like different farming techniques or different things like that it was basically 25 percent of it was due to increase in the actual solar radiation, so just more sunlight reaching those cornfields, causing the crops to grow. That's good information to know, because you can start prioritizing your how you're maintaining your crops. Another one is like the renewable energy. So in a West African community, we worked with a solar consultant that had some underperforming solar panels and they put it in the equatorial region they were expecting wow in, in the summer we should be making this amount of energy and be able to support our our community but it wasn't so they're able to use the power tool with some help from us to or power data sets to determine why but it was it was clouds they weren't making the right amount of energy so they're able to alter their alter their like system for storing energy to be able to account for those peaks and declines due to the, the clouds. And another example for sustainable buildings is in the US, this is actually a space for us story that 
you can go to and Google yourself, but Wicked Joe Coffee, they were doing some analysis to determine how they could potentially save some money to decrease their bottom line of their business. They determined if they put in a solar wall in their specific region, they would save like six or 40 percent of their heating costs, which saves about ten thousand dollars a year, which is a lot of money for smaller and growing businesses in general. So just to point out on here with these different communities, we provide like the time series information, near real time capability and the climatological information in general. So each different community can use those different time periods. These just happen to be the examples that I picked up or for each one of those. So here's an example of a lot of the different locations that users use the power data for. I'm not going to read all of these, but I'm going to highlight some of them while they're going. So Corpus Sustainability, Nokia, the phone company, the um, crop yield one that we discussed earlier, solar panels in Argentina. We have like marine companies that do ship tracking to be able to project and model from that. We have Australian Energy doing solar panel field assessments. We have a lot of different organizations that all use the data. This is only a subset of a very small portion of our users and how it just covers a wide breadth of, of topics within our users. Another cool one is the Nutella. So whenever you eat Nutella, they use our data for their crop modeling. Okay, so here's another one. This is one of the developed ones. It was two years ago now, or last year technically, with a developed project. So in Satellite Beach, Florida, the, the students decide to, to do solar roofs assessments. So they integrated the power data with LIDAR as well as they have the solar radiance with some tilted surface calculations to determine which basically side of the building and what percentage of power so they can get estimates on the if every roof followed the the guidance of the community how it would fare for the energy consumption of that area so here's a little diagram of the steps in the, the flow diagram in the process and here is the top just a map of the solar radiance so just as a note the power data is typically like one degree by one degree or half in 6.25 so this is stretching the limits of the resolution but combining it with the lidar data it's a really good reference of what is available energy for that whole region so basically satellite beach would be one pixel in this scenario but using the lidar they're able to determine each of the buildings footprints and energy availability okay another one is the summer of 2020, Georgia Energy, the third one, they used a rapid, geez, sorry. Do some assessments of like the solar sustainability and figured out that they could use the polar solar information from power to conduct and compare statewide So what can NASA Earth Observation provide? So power currently, we just went to production today with our new version. We provide a few different versions of data all lumped together through one centralized application so people can access those time series, those climatologies, and those monthly data. So for, for example, for the solar data, we, we use GUX SRV version 4 for any time period from 1984 to years 2000, as well as from 2001 to near real time, we use series SYN one degree in combination with the series flash flux to support that near real time until the series product is provided. And then for the meteorology, we use an assimilation model called Merit 2 from the Goddard Modeling and Assimilation Office. And then we use FPIT to provide that data up to near real time until it is replaced with that merit two data. So the big key now, or the new version that was just released today, is we are 
providing hourly data availability to the public through our applications. And we are we increased our number of parameters from 273 to 381. So what sorts of data helps enhance power's utility? So as I was mentioning before, we have the time series versus versus like an average climatology based time series. So some users to do their site feasibility assessments want to do or want to use a climatology to be able to get the, the prediction of the, re, the available solar resources over a given time period. Where others actually want to do that day-to-day -day modeling of the variability and how that can be used to basically in real time almost determine if their solar systems are underperforming or overperforming based on an expected level of solar energy that's available. So we're able to support both of these groups with our services. And how do we access the data? So Power provides an integrated services suite to allow access to the data. So we provide a data access viewer and it enables the users to click on a certain location, fill out a few simple questions, and it provides the data directly back as analysis ready data. So that data can be used immediately for conducting analysis and can be used right away to conduct science or any other need that, that arises. So to support that, we have an application programming interface. So that is what is the backend tool that drives the data availability on the data access viewer. And it enables access via regional, single point, and global. So you can get data for time periods with all those different spatial levels, as well as we actually provide image services as well that people can use and consume directly in ArcGIS and other geospatial clients. So what does the Power API do? So as I was saying a second ago, the analysis ready data is what it provides. So it provides direct ability for ingesting into scientific packages, research projects, and external tools. Like I was mentioning earlier with the ARC, with the um, Red Screen software, our API is actually embedded in that application. So when someone says, clicks the button, says get data, or get data, it pulls directly from our servers and fills in their tool. So it enables other developers to implement solutions using our data. So we take that headache away of actually having to prepare and maintain that data store and just have the services that enable direct access to it. So our services do all the subsetting, numbering, headings with parameter information. We provide a myriad of different format formats, including for hourly, we have the EPW format, which is the EPW or the weather plus, then it's called EPW, they changed the name, sorry. Then we have ASCII, ICASA for the agroclimatology community at the daily level. We have CSV, JSON, NetCDF, and even a few more of that. So when our community members say they'd like a particular format, in most cases we're able to accommodate and build that to be able to help the users be able to use the data more effectively. So as I was saying, Power Data Access Viewer, so it's a series of widgets and tool with a map and enables like a front-end web application for people to select the data efficiently. So you use the drop-down following the questions here. And I'll, there's a video next, and it will walk you through how you can use it. So it supports a single point, regional not shown here, as well as global. And we do have reports and different analytic capabilities as well inside the data access viewer. And it does also show those image services I mentioned before integrated. So you can actually click on the map and have it return a value from a visual as well. So, oh, sorry. So click data access on the home page, click the data access viewer button. Once the data access viewer loads, you're prompted with a splash screen. And we've had a few more tools since then, but this still gets point across. You pick the single point widget, click the temporal level you want, click the little arrow, pick your location. You can set your time period. And each one of these fields you can manually type in or use the drop down widgets that help fill out. Then you can pick your format. 
then you have to pick your parameters. So each of the parameters are named to corresponding to the different communities that you selected earlier. So if you're in certain communities, certain parameters might show up because they're tailored specifically to those communities. And then once it loads, it's already been cached to your computer and you can download the CSV and open it up and start to explore the data. Give a sec, I, I was slow in recording this. There we go. And you can see the data as a time series. So this is provided at hourly, daily, monthly, and climatology. And we do support custom climatology. So if you want an average for any period over any two-year period, we can provide that consecutive two-year period. So for the reports that I was mentioning slightly earlier. So the reports on the enable, we have three main ones. We have the climate anomalies report, the building climate design condition report, which is from ASHRAE's science booklet. But since all the equations are public, we're able to implement that for the community for those areas that don't necessarily have the service sites available because it's it's created. ASHRAE creates the report for about 1,200 and ish sites, but we can have it for every every location on the whole globe. And then we also have a Windows report, just like the previous one I walked through. You select which report you want, pick a location, time period, and a format for the output, and you hit submit, and the API handles everything on the back end and provides you that information directly. So here are the reports. So the left is the building climate design conditions, and anything gray we are working on filling out, but some of those equations we weren't happy with yet, so we need to polish them up. Then we have an anomalies report, which has a couple hundred different plots, but in this example, we only are showing four of them. They can scroll through and do an anomalies, or see if you have climate anomalies in your location based on the time period that you select as well. Then the wind rose report uses the NRL wind classes. It's a great first cut analysis for determining wind site suitability, but you wouldn't necessarily want to use this for your final implementation of building a like a, setting up a wind termite. You would want to get actual surface measurements and put your own anemometer there for a while. But it gives you a ver first cut solution very well. So here are some of the GIS solutions we provide. So we provide both image services and feature services. Some of our main image services are the, the climatology, solar meteorology parameters. For our feature services, we provide rolling four-year thermal climate zones. So you can actually see the change in the in the, the, the climate zone over time. When I have a plot on the next slide, I'll show you what that looks like visually. And you can also compare the differences between two set time periods to be able to determine how the climate is changing. Also, we have these available in the NASA ArcGIS online portal. We have the online via the ASDC RJS portal, and we have some of our data products available through the Esri Living Atlas through partnership with Esri. And if you click that hyperlink when we send the slides out, you can able, be able to access the resources we have online directly. So as I was saying, for the four-year rolling climate zones, you can say, I believe this location is London Heathrow Airport, and you can see how the thermal zones are changing over time, so it's getting drier over time. And it, you see they switch back and forth when you're doing those four-year rolling averages, but eventually it's getting pretty constant as a three over time. So it's just very interesting to see in a, in a graphical way that the change in climate zones, because most people think that the climate doesn't necessarily change, but it does in the sense in a long series, especially that the climate zones it is rare for a US county to change climate zones. And we do work with ASHRAE and we've reviewed some of their climate um, um, county boundary stuff with them. So for the data analytics, sorry, I jumped off topic a bit. We provide Jupyter Notebooks. So we do have a couple of Jupyter Notebooks available online to be able to, to interact directly with the API to be able to pull out the information indirectly, as well as we have some tutorials that if you download some of our static and CDF files, you can actually run through certain steps. Whoops, it jumped slides by accident. Sorry about that. 
that be able to interact with the data directly and follow necessary procedures to do like change assessments or different different topics that we've developed. Next slide is that Jupyter Notebook that I was talking about in ArcGIS. I just updated it this morning to work with the new API that just went into production. So it will look exactly like this on here. Just a few little code blocks have changed based on reading the, the new API structure and syntax. So when you click through, your, you define your location and your time period, and then build your API URL. And then when a matter of about five seconds, it will automatically pull in the data, and it will just teach you how to go through and do some simple pandas manipulations. And then towards the end, we start making some climate anomaly plots, just to show you how you can start interacting with the power data right away. And this was created for a developed fellow class in 2020. So we're maintaining, we're keeping it up to date because it's a very, very useful tutorial that we put together in collaboration. So, so if you'd like to learn more about power, we just recently did some RSET webinars and we did parts three and four, which were mainly talking about how to use renewable energy and building an efficient building energy efficient applications, as well as we did how a whole section on how to access the data via power in our web services. Those have have been slightly, not really slightly out of date, but they've since we went to production today with a new system, all of the examples that we walked through in that webinar will be perfectly operational, knock on wood. <laughs> so last slide here is our documentation. So Power has a lot of documentation and we provide a lot of information about how we gather and prepare the data for, for the users. So we provide some simple documentation on our homepage that includes our parameter manager and dictionaries. We have dashboards to show data availability over time series. And then we have our documentation pages themselves that provide the detailed methodology tutorials or sorry the docs pages do that the tutorials and docs the api pages are developer specific pages that allow you to learn how to use the api if you don't want to use the data data access view if you want a more more nuanced control of the responses from our services so we have a lot of tutorials and how-to guides and faqs on the website so if you ever need to know anything, feel free to email the Power team. But first, I would definitely check the Power Docs because hopefully it's in there. So thank you very much. Um, again, uh, this is Bradley McPherson presenting on behalf of Dr. Paul Stackhouse and the rest of the Power team. Hey, is there any questions? I have, I have a question to get us started. Get started. Um, um, uh, my question is, um, you know, you talked a lot about the, the partners and the projects that you all work on. Um, how do you choose those partners? Do they come to you or um, is it a conversation um, that you have within the team of looking for new partners? Um, I know you have like a global uh, stretch of partners. So I'm just wondering how those come to you. So Dr. Paul Stackout has a lot of relationships. His, the Power Project's been around for about 20 years or 25 years. So he's a lot of partners. So we partner with NRAIL in the US, partner with a lot of different universities. So basically, if anybody that emails us, if we think there can be a collaboration or we think we can work with them, we definitely embrace that. Because we, we like to get the data out to more users and especially promote NASA Earth observation data. So any opportunity that there are new new users, we we jump at the chance to help them. So that's why you saw the list of the formats. If someone says there's a special format that only the small groups use, we'll make it and then we'll advertise it and then that community will start growing, hopefully. Awesome, thank you. If anyone else has any questions, feel free to raise your hand or drop them in the chat. We have a couple minutes before we are going to move back to flash talks.
There's a question in the chat. Do you ever work with indigenous peoples? So power does not specifically work with indigenous people that I know of, but I know there's a lot of other groups that use our data that do. So we basically, we basically been working with a lot of bigger organizations to help disseminate the data where we were working with one group, I can't really say their name right now, that that is one of their goals in the short term. And we just had a meeting with them last week or short term and long term, but yep. So answer is technically, but not directly us. Any other questions? If anyone else has any questions, you can feel free to um, pop them in the chat and we can make sure that um, the power team gets back to you. But um, thank you so much, Bradley. That was a, a really informative presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, with that, we can get back to the flash talks. Um, so let me just share my screen one moment. Can everyone see that? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, so the Peru Health and Air Quality team, um, Nelson, do you want to take us away? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining today and uh, welcome to the Peru Health and Air Quality presentation. So today we're going to be looking a little bit at land use change in the Peruvian Amazon and its effect on zoonotic disease spread. Uh, next slide, please. So our project was focused on the Madre de Dios, a biodiverse region of Peru that has undergone some rapid land use change in the past couple of decades. Massive deforestation has occurred due to gold mining operations, which have increased dramatically since the 1980s. Um, in 2012, the interoceanic highway was completed, further exposing this area to development. Um, our end users, the Peru Ministry of Health and the Peru Ministry of the Environment, wanted to know specifically about the correlation between land use change and the spread of dengue fever and leishmaniasis. Dengue incidence in the Amazon has risen notably since 2000 due to rapid urbanization, increasing habitat for the disease's vector, the Aedes aegypti mosquito. Leishmaniasis, which is, trans, uh, which is transmitted by sand flies, tends to be associated more with forest habitats. And as human development continues to encroach on forested areas, uh, the Ministry of Health is concerned about those increased incidents. Uh, next slide, please. So our workflow for this project kind of looked a little something like this. We uh, gathered Landsat 8 satellite data for the years 2010, 2015, and 2020, and created training data on Google Earth Pro, and created polygons to characterize samples of land for our classes. We input these training data into the random forest model on Google Earth Engine, and then checked the validity, validity using a confusion matrix. Um, after that, we then used the land use land classification maps to analyze changes in land cover from 2010 to 2020, by using a raster calculator to combine these maps into change maps. We also obtained disease reports from the Ministry of Health, which we visualized by district on a map and then normalized the numbers using population. Using our results from the land use land, class, or land use land classification and land change analysis, we correlated land cover and disease incidents and land changes and disease incidents. Next slide, please. Um, so to the left here, you see a zoomed in photo of the La Pampa illegal mining area in Madre de Dios. Um, in the middle of that map, you can kind of see that strip of yellow, which is the interoceanic highway that I was talking about, and that cuts through the forest area and the mining areas. Um, the district that contains this mining area is called Inambari, and it had the highest mining growth in the entire region with about 241 square kilometers of new mining area which is equivalent to about 34,000 soccer fields just in the past 10 years. Now, speaking more broadly, Madre de Dios as a whole lost about 2,363 square kilometers of forest cover just in the past 10 years, 
which is equivalent to 331,000 soccer fields or almost the entire country of Luxembourg. Now on the right side here, um, you can see maps for dengue and leishmaniasis disease incidents um, by district and normalized by population with the darker blue indicating more disease incidents. Normalizing the disease incidents by population allows us to see that there are relatively high case rates for dengue fever throughout the region, as opposed to just in the large population hub, which is located in the southeastern uh, part of the uh, Mar de Dios. We can also see that um, leishmaniasis clearly has more of an effect on rural areas as Manu, the, the darkest blue district on the left side, has far higher case rates than anywhere else in the region. Uh, next slide, please. So keeping our end users in mind, we wanted to see if there was a certain correlations between land use or land change and disease increase. Now, Inambari, the district I was just talking about, um, that it was the one that saw the most mining and urban expansion, and they also had the highest rates for dengue fever. Now, Manu is the district that saw the fourth largest forest loss in the region, only behind districts that had large increases in mining, such as Inambari, and Manu actually had the highest rates for leishmaniasis. Now, um, more specifically about correlations, we calculated uh, Spearman's rank correlation coefficients and found a statistically significant positive relationship between urbanization and both dengue and leishmaniasis, in, leishmaniasis incidents. For dengue, we had a row of about 0.66 with a p-value of 0.03. And for leishmaniasis, we had a row of 0.73 and a p-value of 0.015. Now, because of the very small sample size and the use of a non-parametric statistical test, we expect that uh, future work might reveal additional correlations that our analysis um, was not powerful enough to show. Um, now, the good news is that we are excited that this project will be continuing into the fall term, where they will be looking more specifically at risk modeling for the zoonotic disease incidents, incidents in this region. Um, the output land use land classification maps that we made this term may be used in conjunction with additional environmental variables such as humidity, precipitation, elevation, and seasonality to, de to determine which specific areas of the Mato de Dios region are more at risk to different zoonotic disease. Uh, next slide, please. Um, now we have we worked with so many partners and we are so grateful for all their help um, along with this term. So we would like to thank all of them and thank all of you for listening today. And I hope you guys have a great rest of the day and enjoy the rest of the presentations. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, next up, we're gonna look at Fairfax County Urban Development um, and Caden O'Connell is gonna present. All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Caden O'Connell and I will be discussing the impact of urban development on urban climates. Um, the urban heat island effect, as well as using NASA Earth observations to mitigate extreme heat. Um, so this presentation will focus on the research that we conducted for our partners at the Fairfax County Office of Environmental and Energy Coordination, um, which used the Invest Urban Cooling Model to reveal climate trends, as well as possible heat mitigation strategies. All right, so the image on the left shows our study area of Fairfax County, Virginia, where we conducted our study on urban heat islands. The urban heat island effect refers to a phenomenon where temperatures of developed areas tends to be higher than nearby undeveloped areas. And this is due to a high amount of impervious surfaces as well as reduced tree canopy. So urban heat has a number of effects, including negative impacts on public health, increased energy consumption, as well as disproportionate effects on low income communities that may not have access to air conditioning or other ways of cooling off. So by using NASA Earth observations, we are able to pinpoint the areas that are on, under the greatest amount of stress, which gives county officials the ability to then enact policies to address it. So in order to study the urban heat islands in Fairfax County, we gathered land surface temperatures using the OLI and tier sensors on Landsat 8, as well as nighttime land surface temperatures using EcoStress aboard the International Space Station. So the heat vulnerability index, which shows the population sensitivity and exposure to heat, was generated using census data detailing socioeconomic and health variables in Fairfax County um, in combination with heat anomaly data. <clears throat> so multiple Earth observation data sets, as well as the Invest Urban Cooling Model, were used to calculate the heat mitigation index. These data sets include, but are not limited to, albedo, land use, evapotranspiration, building intensity, and green area. So by considering all these data sets, 
the invest model locates the most impactful and cost effective regions to increase tree canopy cover to maximize urban cooling potential. <clears throat> All right, so displayed here are a few maps that were generated during this study. The summer daytime heat anomaly map in the top left shows the shows the areas above the county's average summer temperature. The blue areas represent temperatures below the county's average, while red areas are temperatures above the county average. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, these red zones show the location of urban heat islands in highly developed areas. Notice how the red areas in the map correlate with the regions of low vegetation in the tree canopy map to its right. This pattern perfectly demonstrates a main cause of the, herb of the urban heat island, which is a lack of vegetation common in, in developed areas. The daytime heat, heat mitigation map at the bottom left scores areas of the county on their capacity to mitigate heat. From one, able to completely mitigate heat shown in blue, to zero, no ability to mitigate heat shown in red. <clears throat> the red areas with low cooling capacity are associated with highways, commercial, industrial, and business zones, while the blue areas tend to be natural and forested. The heat vulnerability map in the bottom right corner is one of the most important products of our study showing the distribution of heat vulnerable populations in Fairfax County, considering both heat exposure and the population sensitivity to heat. We found that vulnerability was most apparent in, in uh, East Fairfax County. <clears throat> and so the heat vulnerability index helps county officials to prioritize areas for cooling strategies and establish public cooling centers in the most effective locations. So this research will allow end users to understand the spatial distribution of heat sensitivity and heat exposure within their county, um, prioritize areas for heat mitigation initiatives, and choose the most effective heat mitigation strategy, as well as assess, it, assess its effectiveness. Um, and in addition, it will also um, help them communicate urban heat data to the public. All right, and I just want to thank my team members who worked so hard to complete this project, um, our partners at the Fairfax County um, Environmental and Energy Coordination, our science advisors, and our developed fellow, Adriana LeCamp. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to present our findings. I think you're muted, Madeline. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, for the last presentation, Paxton and Sophie are going to be talking about Cincinnati and Covington, Covington open, urban development. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm Sophie here with my teammate Paxton. Uh, we're two members of the summer 2021 NASA Develop Boston team. Today, we'll be telling you about our project over the past 10 week term assessing flooding and landslide susceptibility along the Ohio Kentucky border. Cincinnati, Ohio, and Covington, Kentucky have a history of damaging floods and landslide events. These events jeopardize built infrastructure and public health. They also pose a huge economic burden on municipal and state governments for cleanup and repairs. Moreover, areas of high susceptibility and exposure to these hazards are largely unknown to our partners, Groundwork USA and Groundwork Ohio River Valley. These organizations promote environmental justice and sustainability in urban communities like our study area. Our objective as a NASA developed urban development team was to identify at risk regions in the greater Cincinnati area by analyzing flooding events and landslides between 2004 and 2021. Our methodology was twofold. First, I'll focus on our methods for modeling urban stormwater flooding. We leveraged the Integrated Valuation of Ecosystem Services and Trade-offs, or INVEST, Urban Flood Risk Mitigation Model to illustrate the study area's capacity to retain water runoff following a storm. This model requires environmental attributes for the study area as inputs, including watershed vectors, a land cover raster map, and depth of rainfall, uh, for which we referenced NASA Earth observations from GPM iMERGE. Uh, the model generates runoff values and runoff retention, illustrating how neighborhoods are equipped to handle stormwater flooding. You go to that next right panel there. Uh, we also focused on mapping landslide susceptibility and exposure. Susceptibility was calculated using the factors that tr contribute to landslide events in our study area. Among the seven total factors we selected were slope, lithology, and normalized difference vegetation index, or NDVI, which we calculated from Landsat 8 Earth observations. 
Data sets for each of the final factors were standardized and overlaid using tools in ArcGIS Pro, allowing us to generate a landslide susceptibility map for the study area. This susceptibility map was combined with census block group data to develop an exposure map. Exposure maps highlight populations that may be especially vulnerable to landslide events, such as those experiencing poverty. Using the INVEST urban flood risk mitigation model, our team produced maps displaying runoff and runoff retention in the study area. One runoff retention map, displayed on the left in shades of blue, assessed runoff retention for a 2.3 inch per day rainfall storm event. These results, shown here as percentages of the total daily rainfall, indicated high levels of stormwater runoff in more urbanized areas and lower levels of stormwater runoff in vegetated areas such as forests and grasslands. Transitioning to the right panel, the result of rescaling and overlaying predictive factors is this landslide susceptibility map. It's reclassed into the raster's 50th, 75th, 90th, and 95th percentiles to categorize susceptibility assessment. These reflect very low, low, moderate, high, and very high areas of landslide susceptibility. This analysis indicated that areas along major roads and the riverbanks are zones highly susceptible to landslide occurrence. To validate these results, the susceptibility map was compared to points of landslide occurrence shown above in purple. As you can see, a significant number of these landslide occurrences correlate to areas of high landslide susceptibility. Next slide, please. Mapping runoff and runoff retention allows our partners to understand land cover types contributing to flooding and prioritize areas of greatest concern to populations facing flood hazards in the study area. Once harmful areas have been identified, partners can focus flood mitigation efforts on specific areas to protect those impacted communities. In our analysis, we learned that across a number of storm events with daily rainfall ranging from 2.3 inches to 6 inches, the urbanized portions of both Cincinnati and Covington barely retained 10% of the total daily rainfall, while forested areas were able to retain nearly 90%. We also determined that the landslide susceptibility mapping will better enable partners to accurately identify areas of high landslide susceptibility and exposure and allocate resources and attention to the communities that are most vulnerable to these natural hazards. This methodology allows partners to incorporate census data to assess priority demographics and communities of concern within different regions. They can also champion projects that develop interventions in these communities and foster resiliency both in their infrastructure and population. Next slide, please. Uh, finally, we just wanted to say thank you to everyone who helped us with this project, our fellows, Celeste Gambito, our project partners, our science advisors, and also the spring term contributors. Awesome. Thank you all so much for those presentations. Um, does anyone have any questions? I have a question for the Fairfax team. Um, you said that you all looked at vulnerability in addition to, um, you know, heat and all of those things. Um, I wondered how you define vulnerability and what that index looks like. Yeah, so we actually used a number of factors to calculate our vulnerability. Um, part of that was looking at which populations tend to be more vulnerable depending on their age or pre-existing conditions. Um, as well as their living situations um, and financial situations. So some people um, in certain uh, financial positions may not have the ability to, you know, mitigate heat within their own home. Um, and so we take that into account, um, as well as uh, the various other factors that uh, make someone more vulnerable to heat. And is that all census data or is that a mix of data sources? Yeah, so it was um, a lot of the socioeconomic data was uh, from retrieved from census data. Um, and then we had some other data, including um, data looking at how it, people who live in mobile homes or um, as well as a few other data sets, health related data sets that we got from the county. Cool, thank you so much. Sure thing. Any other questions? I have a question for, it's kind of for both the Cincinnati and Fairfax teams. 
Um, really just about your experience using the invest model. Um, I think it's really cool that you both use the, I guess, different modules of the invest model. And it seems like it's really could be really beneficial to a lot of, you know, local decision makers. Um, but I was wondering how kind of user friendly uh, is the model? And do you think that is it something that could be easily adopted by decision makers? Or do you think kind of the the technical barrier to using it is is maybe too much if you don't have a really technical background? Um, so I can kind of speak for the Fairfax team. Um, it's we it definitely isn't the most user friendly model. Um, we did run into a few issues with it, but it's um, in looking at its uh, manual, it's pretty easy to um, you know put the put those inputs in and get um, a good product. But I, I wouldn't say on the face of it that it's the most user friendly. Uh, just to add to that, because we did use a different invest model, I did feel like this one was simpler than the urban heat mitigation model. Um, and I will also add that invest has a very active user online board to ask questions and they generally responded very quickly, which I think would be really helpful for more lay people trying to use it. So I'm sure the usability varies between models, but I felt like the flood risk mitigation one was not too bad. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, I've seen, of course, many developed projects have used it in the past, and I think their uh, ability to interpret the results is really variable, kind of depending on what um, module they're using. Some seems to be uh, pretty technical now, but so great to hear your experiences with it. Any other questions for the teams? I have another question, if no one else does. Uh, this one is for the Peru team. Um, I think I'm just interested, you know, we do a lot of, maybe not a lot, um, a good amount of international projects. Um, and I think working with kind of international partners is, you know, very different than working from, you know, partners within the US that I think we kind of understand, you know, the conditions a little bit better and how the different kind of decision-making organizations work. Um, and I know that the, the Peru team worked with quite a few different end user organizations um, in country. So I was just kind of interested in your, your experience working with the, with the different partners and how you think your project can, can benefit them in terms of decision making. Um, yeah, so that's a, good, that's a good point. And the kind of the first thing we, so like our first partner meeting was quite large. So that was, it was fun. But the first thing we all, my entire team kind of knows is they were really knowledgeable in their, so they they were really in touch. We worked with a lot of NGOs that like have worked in that specific area. So they they really knew, and it was kind of they we were kind of familiarizing with the technology behind it and some of the patterns that we were seeing. And I mean, I think it really can benefit them in the future. Again, like this product is continuing in the future and um, kind of getting a more basic level. So like being able to map out like where you are and where like how at risk you are based on where you're located. Um, is really cool, but it was also cool because we worked with like we we got data from like government sources as well and then also you know, NGOs. So just that whole collaborative process, I think, made it easier and we were able to communicate more and get information developed quicker. So it was really fun. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, while you're um, here, Nelson, and I have another question for the Peru team. Um, you said that the like dengue has been increasing since um, 2000 or, or around then, um, and I saw your your study period was 2010 to 2020. So I was wondering why that um, that was that time period. Was it just that that is when like the most uh, urban development has been happening, or if something specific changed in 2010, or if that was just like the most convenient for data? Um, I was just wondering how that study period got chosen. Yeah, I mean, I think um, partly it was kind of convenient data wise, but um, kind of one of the key things was the construction of that highway was really a big because previously it was kind of a more untouched part of the country but that that um, connection between it was intended to connect Brazil and Peru coast to coast essentially and that really allowed like development to really increase and then secondary roads can branch off of that so it kind of really speeds up the process a bit so things I mean if you look at um like in our like longer form presentation, if you look at the cases, there's literally in 2000, like 20 cases in the entire region. 
And then like once you kind of hit 2010, it goes where we're going way up to like 2000, 3000. So I think that was kind of what mitigated just and it kind of exponentially increased the cases. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, Darcy, go ahead and ask your question. Oh, thanks, Alan. Um, yeah, I was, my question is for <laughs> um, the team from the Boston note. I'm wondering for the landscape mapping that you mentioned, what were the what were the population factors that you mentioned went into that? And also, I'm curious about the results of that. I'm wondering if maybe that was something that just didn't make it into this more kind of condensed um, presentation. Absolutely. Yeah. So we used um, census block data to uh, basically overlaid on the susceptibility map to detail uh, exposure or who was basically at, uh, at the highest risk uh, for maybe experiencing a landslide event and obviously all the concomitant issues that come with that. Um, and the three kind of groups we focused on were um, the African American population in uh, in the study area, just because that is the largest minority group uh, in that region. Uh, also elderly folks, so people over the age of 85, um, and the impoverished population, those below the poverty line in the area. So we kind of identified those uh, people who kind of met those met those criteria and just kind of mapped that in a uh, bivariate distribution with uh, susceptibility to determine where are, where are we seeing biggest overlaps between high susceptibility areas and areas that have uh, people belonging to uh, any of these three groups. And that was how we determined um, uh, exposure. And yeah, as for results, uh, we found a few, we kind of identified uh, a few key neighborhoods, most of which were in uh, Cincinnati proper that had uh, highest exposure uh, to, you know, people uh, again fitting any of these criteria. Whereas Kentucky had uh, a great deal more, say, of uh, landslide susceptibility, or they had higher landslide susceptibility on average, though uh, those populations, those vulnerable populations weren't as well represented in that area. So exposure tended to be more on the uh, Ohio side of things. Thanks for your question. Thank you. That's really interesting. Thanks for your response. Yeah, and um, we have another question for the Peru team in the chat. Um, have you considered added gridding, adding gridded population data for the study to help tease out what increases are due to population density? Yeah, so the population part of our study was actually really interesting. So we kind of had to ga gather data. It was kind of hard to figure out the population data. So we they have a census in 2007, 2017. So we kind of had to aggregate population, um, sort of estimate it. And what's interesting about the region is there's the capital of the region is called Puerto Maldonado. And it, it contains it literally contains like 80 percent of the region's population so when, without normalizing for a population obviously dengue fever was like centered in that area and then kind of nowhere else but um so in like so a lot of that is would be due to population density but then it was interesting kind of what we found out is that in these like new increases of mining areas is actually you're seeing a little bit more population density there potentially and then that's also where you're seeing a little bit of that dengue fever increase um but yeah, in general, that is a great point. Awesome. Yeah, and then a question for the Fairfax team. Um, what is the hole in the center of the county? I think that's referring to your study area map. Right, yeah. <clears throat> so the, uh, the hole in the center of the county is actually Fairfax City, which is separate from the county. Um, so when we were... Uh, working with our partners um, at the Fairfax Office of Environmental and Energy Coordination. Um, they requested that we not use the, the city because that wasn't a part of their um, jurisdiction. Awesome, thank you for that clarification. Um, any other last minute questions? We have a couple more minutes left. Um, I'm happy to stay on if anyone else has anything that they wanna ask. And if not, I'll just say thank you so much to all the presenters um, today. I know that that was so much work represented in just um, a few hours of presentation. So um, thank you all for giving those really awesome and very quick overviews of these projects. Um, 
is a great way to learn more about Develop and Servere and our set in power. Yeah, and I just wanted to do another plug that we have two hours of plenary sessions tomorrow for water and agriculture starting at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and then we have another kind of two hour session of flash talks in the afternoon. So hope you can join us again tomorrow.